Um, I'm going to talk about the early growth of the Japanese community in London. Um, you will have seen mentioned in the exhibition downstairs that one of the earliest encounters between Britain and Japan included the arrival of William Adams in a Dutch ship that ran aground off the coast of Kyushu in 1600. Among the earliest arrivals from Japan to Britain included two young Christian converts who were picked up by the navigator Thomas Cavendish when he was shipwrecked in Japan in 1587. And there was also a group of about 11 sailors who arrived in 1614 with Captain John Saris, who was chief merchant on the first English voyage to Japan. And then there was Otokichi, who was shipwrecked on the Pacific coast in America and brought to London in 1835 by a trader. Otokichi never lived in Britain, however, but worked for the British in Macau and Singapore, in, in Shanghai, and became a naturalized British citizen, taking the name John Matthew Otosong. Otokichi was never able to return to Japan as the Tokugawa Bakufu's seclusion policy was strictly enforced and going abroad was punishable by death. <clears throat> The ban on foreign travel continued until 1866, but the arrival of Commodore Matthew Perry at Uraga Bay in 1853 had awakened the realization that Japan could no longer exist in isolation. And so the first intentional travels abroad were initially in the form of Bakufu missions, followed by Bakufu students and other students sent from individual Han. Here is the photograph of the shogunate's official mission to Europe in 1862, during which Fukuzawa Yukichi served as an interpreter, and the Choshu Five, who came in 1863. Two years later, the Satsuma students arrived, and these arrivals were when overseas travel was still banned. A wave of travel abroad came with the end of the ban and introduction of permits. Not surprisingly, the first wave of migrants from Japan were samurai students who went to the West to acquire Western knowledge. Of the first 70 permits for foreign travel issued by the shogunate, 38 were given to students. Interestingly, the remaining 32 permits were issued to acrobats who took the opportunity to extend their touring activities abroad. While the samurai students would have been a fascination to the British public, I think perhaps the touring acrobats may have played a significant role in promoting the craze for Japan. The Japanese government first officially recorded the number of Japanese students in Britain in 1887, when the number was 264, centered mainly in London and Glasgow. Among them were 64 students, 62 officials, and a scattered number of businessmen, craftsmen, and entertainers. The single largest group consisted of servants who numbered 78. These were servants not seeking to work for British families, but who made up part of the Japanese households to serve their upper-class masters. By 1911, the number of Japanese in Britain increased to over 500. <clears throat> the occupational categories broadened to include government officials, businessmen, students, bankers, skilled workers, priests and missionaries, performers, entertainers, tradesmen, journalists, servants, cooks, restaurateurs, printers, photographers, gardeners, educators, salesmen and miscellaneous trades. The Japan-British exhibition of 1910 held at White City brought to the British public an opportunity to see an unprecedented and extensive range of fine art from Japan. The exhibition also brought to London a number of artists and craftsmen, some who remained in Britain, thus boosting the artist population among the Japanese. I have in this slide a distinction between expatriates and independents, 
the expatriates being those sent to Britain by the government, banks or large corporations, and the independents being those who ran small businesses or were self-employed. Just going back to the numbers again. Um, generally speaking, the number of Japanese increased immediately following the end of the First World War and remained on average somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500, with the exceptions of a few years in the late 1920s. The reason for the decline in numbers in the second half of the 1920s is most likely an economic one. The Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923 had huge economic consequences which contributed to the banking collapse of 1927. And many bankers and employees of trading companies based in London were recalled to Japan. The proportion of females in relation to males remained consistently low during the 1920s at between 10 to 20 percent and increased in the 1930s up to as high as 50 percent. The numbers in the parentheses here are the female numbers. The increase is not necessarily because more Japanese women were arriving in Britain, which was the case in America, where Japanese, quote, picture brides arrived en masse. But because Japanese men were marrying English women, who would automatically be counted in, as Japanese upon marriage. The figures that appear in the table give us the overall numbers, but do not give us any insight into birth, marriages, deaths, nor the level of actual arrivals and departures of the Japanese to and from Britain. <coughs> so, what was it like for these early arrivals to Japan to Britain? Yoshio Markina is one of the best known Japanese artists in London of the time and provides a glimpse into what life was like for a struggling artist. And that's the composition. Here's, here's Makino. There's Makino. Ma Makino, which he spelled his name with an R and was Yoshio Markino. Um, he arrived in London in December 1897 after spending four years in San Francisco. Here is his own description of his move from America to Britain. And I quote, while I had been there for four years, I never went out to the parks, for I was frightened of those savage people who threw stones and bricks at me, and I was spat on more occasionally. Of course, they were very low-class peoples, but even better-class peoples had not a very nice manner to the Japanese. After such experiences, I was naturally surprised with the cosmopolitan ideas of the Londoners. I started my first sightseeing from Hyde Park and the Green Park and St. James's Park. I so timidly walked inside the rail. Nobody shouted me. Then I went near the crowds of people with still more fear. Being quite ignorant of English civilization, I anticipated some pebble showers every minute. I waited and waited with beating heart, but nothing happened to me at all. Nobody spat on me. Hello, hello, what's the matter? I said in my heart. Perhaps they don't know I am Japanese. I took off my hat on purpose to show my black hair. Finally, one man pushed me quite accidentally, and he touched his hand to his hat and apologized me very politely. So even among the Japanese who had not lived in America before coming to Britain, the English sense of fair play and minding one's own business were repeatedly mentioned as aspects of British culture most treasured by the Japanese who lived in Britain in the interwar years. Among the British public, there was a strand of admiration for Japan in the years before 1914. Between 1894 and 1905, Japan achieved spectacular military successes against China and Russia. Among military circles within Britain, and curiously, Fabian socialist intellectuals, there was a fascination with Japan and with Japan's swift emergence as the most powerful nation in East Asia. And a number of books and editorials appeared on Bushido and the Samurai Code of Ethics. 
The signing of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902 entered into on a basis of equality, recognized the international status of Japan among nations, and marked the beginning of a special relationship with Britain. These are Yoshino Makino's um, uh, paintings. Uh, after arriving penniblessly in London, Makino was given a job at the offices of the Imperial Japanese Navy and enrolled in evening classes, evening art classes. Once let go by the Navy, he took on odd jobs here and there, posing as a model in Japanese costume at an art school, and one time working for a tombstone maker drawing designs for graves. This job lasted only three months because his angels looked more like ballet dancers and offended the more religious mourners. Most of his days were spent pounding the pavement in the city, going from publisher to publisher in search for a sale or commission. His lucky break came when M. H. Spielman, editor of the Magazine of Art, bought several of his sketches and published them. Spielman also introduced him to Douglas Slayton, the author of Queer Things About Japan, and became one of the regulars at Slayton's Kensington Tea Parties, attended by painters, poets, and writers. This was the beginning of Marquino's most prolific period, with a number of published sketches and commissions. The high life of Edwardian era ended abruptly, however, with the outbreak of the First World War, and although he continued to work and paint, write and paint, Marquino became once again financially constrained. While innocence, um, Marquino was extremely learned and cultured, he had a childlike innocence that endeared him to a few devoted friends, both British and Japanese, who took it upon themselves to look after him. Although Marquino may not be representative, of the lives of many of the Japanese artists in London, his circumstances nevertheless provide an insight into the general milieu of an artist's experience. To the artistic and literary establishment in London society, there was a fascination with things Japanese which started as early as 1862, when over 600 Japanese artifacts, all brought over from Japan by Rutherford Alcock, the then minister in Japan, were exhibited at the World Fair in London. So that's the World Fair um, in London, the exterior and the interior. Many of the items bought by Farmer and Rogers formed the basis of their oriental warehouse, whose um, store manager, Arthur Lazenby Liberty, was to go on to open his own shop in 1875. It was this general interest in Japan and her arts that enabled artists such as Markino to live and work in Britain with some measure of success. With increased interest in Japanese art, we emerged a number of art and antique dealers specializing in oriental arts, such as Yamanaka in London, New York, and Boston, and Samuel Bing in Paris. Yamanaka and Company whose head office was in Osaka, established their London branch in 1900 at New Bond Street. Yamanaka Sadajiro, the proprietor, and his general manager, Tomita Kumasaku, built up the reputation of the dealership with British royalty among its list of customers. Whilst Yamanaka was the most prominent among the antique dealers, there were also others who formed part of the early Japanese community in London. Kato Shouzo, who until his death in 1930, at the age of 79, was the doyen of the community. He, he arrived in Britain in 1886 and had made London his home for over 40 years. There were other individuals whom he engaged in arts and other trades. Koizumi Gunji, who was a judo master and creator of the Budokai, was also a known lacquer expert affiliated with the Victoria and Albert Museum. The Tori brothers had a, fa a furniture factory in Brixton, mm -hmm. and Yano Takuma had a bonsai nursery and garden furniture operation in Hammersmith, in addition to his restaurant business. <laughs> 
Those engaged in specialty trades were among the longest standing Japanese within the community, most having arrived in Britain before 1920. As I just mentioned, Yano Takuma, in addition to his Japanese garden operation, ran a successful restaurant business. Restaurants formed an important component of the Japanese community. The earliest record of an established restaurant is Uno Mantaro's Miyakote, which opened around 1906. Yano Takuma inherited a restaurant called Chiyoshi in 1916 and reopened under the name of Hinodea. Hinodea became the gathering place for members of the resident Japanese community. The halcyon days for Japanese restaurants in London were in the 1924-25 period, just before a number of Japanese companies went bankrupt in the aftermath of the financial crisis following the great Kanto earthquake, closing their London offices. In January 1925, in the January 1925 edition of the Nichie Shinshi, which was the Japanese monthly community newspaper, published between 1915 and 1938, there's um, a whole brief uh, profile of the six restaurants that were operating at the time. They were Hinodeya, proprietor, Yano Takuma, Miyako Club, proprietor, Uno Mantaro, Kogetsu, started by Ota Hanako, and now run by Kawamura Sen, Toyokan, proprietor, Satake Tamekichi, Tokiwa, proprietor, Iwasaki Moritaro. Ikuine Club, proprietor, Ikuine Jukichi. It is mentioned that Ikuine Club no longer exists and the proprietor now runs a Western-style restaurant called the Yokohama Restaurant on Villager Street. Many of these proprietors had worked in one of the existing establishments before setting up on their own. The restaurant community was a small, close-knit one with probably as much rivalry as camaraderie, but nevertheless, each establishment playing a central role in the Japanese community which they served. The sheer amount of tidbits on them in the Nichie Shinshi is testimony to how they functioned as a unifying element in the community, and the owners were generous contributors to every kind of community collection. <coughs> At the same time, some of the proprietors added some spice to the community. Within a year of being mentioned in the Nichie Shinshi, Kawamura Sen, the proprietor of Kogetsu, was sentenced to six months in prison for having injured a Mrs. Takebayashi Fumiko by pistol in Monte Carlo. <laughs> As colorful as its demise was its beginning, for Kogetsu had been started by actress Ota Hanako as a sideline business in 1919 on Baker Street. Although she became an actress, Hanako's background was that of a traveling entertainer, similar to the Japanese acrobats and jugglers who had a long tradition of overseas tours. Hanako, born Ota Hisa to a provincial family in central Japan, trained as a geisha, then heard that Japanese dancers were wanted in Copenhagen and set out on her own in 1902. <coughs> Whilst touring in England, she was discovered by Louis Fuller, an American dancer and impresario who had been the manageress of Sadayako, the brilliant dancer and actress who had performed before the Prince of Wales in 1899. Sadayako had returned to Japan and Fuller saw in Hanako a suitable successor. Hanako toured all over Europe, and in 1906, she met Auguste Rodin in Paris, to whom she became his later life muse. He called her Petite Hanako. She was only 138 centimeters tall, and had her life live in his residence when she was not touring. Rodin made many heads, masks, and busts of Hanako, and you can see one on, on the right. Another individual who I believe both benefited from and helped create the craze for Japan is Tani Mukio, a Jujitsu practitioner who was brought to Britain in 1899 by a Victorian entrepreneur, Barton Wright, 
Wright's intention was to have Kenny teach his jujitsu skills during the day and take on professional wrestlers in music hall acts during the evenings. Aged only 19 and standing about 5 foot 2 inches and weighing just over 50 kilos, his act was to accept any challenge from members of the audience, to step up on stage and try their luck against him in any form of wrestling combat. Because of his small stature and his continuous victory over large English challengers, including well-known boxers and wrestlers, Tani became quite a celebrity in those circles. With the decline of the British Music Hall in general, however, Tani's theatrical engagements also began to dwindle and disappeared altogether by the First World War. In the meantime, Tani's manager had founded the British Society for Jiu Jitsu in 1904, and Tani was engaged as an instructor. Although Tani raised awareness of interest in Jiu Jitsu and Judo to an extent, in Britain, the sport was regarded mainly as an acrobatic spectacle or a form of self-defense. It was only in 1918 when Koizumi Gunji established the Martial Arts Club, the Budokai, that Judo became an established sport in Britain. Koizumi was the most remarkable individual of the pre-war Japanese community, best known for his dedication to the welfare of the community and his contribution to the spreading judo in Britain. It was never Koizumi's intention to create a judo club as a meeting place for the Japanese to socialize amongst themselves. Rather, it was his sense of mission to introduce to the West the martial arts of the East that provided the direction of the club. Within 10 years, the club's membership grew to around 330 members, over two thirds being non-Japanese. I have highlighted a few individuals who formed part of the growing early Japanese community in London. I hope I have been able to illustrate how the craze for Japan, which took hold of London from the late 19th century to the very early part of the 20th century, was a two-way phenomenon. The fascination with Japanese arts and culture in Britain had in turn created opportunities for Japanese artists and tradespeople to come to Britain and make a living and sometimes even thrive in a hospitable environment. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here to speak to you this evening about the Silver Studio and the influence of Japan on British design at the end of the 19th century. The Silver Studio was a company that produced designs for wallpapers and textiles. It operated in London, in fact in Hammersmith, from 1880, and the contents of the studio now belong to the museum, the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture. So the Silver Studio gives us a kind of small case study of how British designers absorbed Japanese influences, and in turn how that influenced Japan's sense of its own identity. So as you've already seen from the exhibition downstairs, there was a great deal of interest in Japan at the uh, end of the 19th century. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And then I'll say a bit about the Silver Studio. And then I'm going to go on to discuss the ways in which the Silver Studio was influenced by certain Japanese objects, and in particular their collect collection of katagami stencils and Japanese glass papers, which are now part of the Silver Studio collection. And I'm going to finish by showing how recent research is challenging the idea that Britain simply appropriated Japanese ideas and that, ja and that Japan had kind of no part to play in that process. So as we all know, um, as we've seen from the exhibition downstairs, the, the craze for Japan first emerged in the 1870s and 80s. And in these decades, Britain, um, Japan opened up to trade with the West after a long period of isolation. Europeans saw Japanese art and design as exciting and exotic because it was so different from Western culture. <coughs> 
when it became fashionable for wealthy consumers to fill their homes with Japanese items, or things, at least, that they thought were Japanese. For example, in this painting, you can see fans, a silk fabric, blue and white porcelain, and wallpapers and textiles that featured Japanese motifs, such as cranes, dragons, chrysanthemums, and key patterns also became very popular. So as Keiko's already mentioned, the London department store Liberty & Co opened in 1875 and from as early as 1876 was selling Japanese wallpapers and fabrics. Arthur, Le Arthur Lazenby Liberty travelled to Japan himself, as did British designers such as Christopher Dresser and Walter Crane. Other designers such as E.W. Godwin developed what became known as Anglo-Japanese style. Uh, in terms of furniture and interior decoration. This style drew on Japanese ideas such as simplification of layout, uh, although there was some disagreement between those who wanted to draw on a thorough understanding of aesthetic principles and those who just wanted to incorporate Japanese motifs. Nevertheless, British consumers became increasingly familiar with Japanese design through international exhibitions, again as Keiko has mentioned, and department stores, and they wanted to incorporate these into their own homes. British designers, manufacturers and retailers soon realised that there was a vast demand for Japanese goods, but that this demand could not be wholly supplied by Japanese production methods. In addition, authentic Japanese style was somewhat at odds with British tastes. So by the 1870s and 80s, companies such as Liberty were commissioning designs for wallpapers and textiles from British designers, which referenced Japanese sources while modifying them to Western tastes. So this design for a woven textile by E.W. Godwin was produced by Warner & Co and it clearly draws on Japanese motifs such as mon, the, um, the round symbol. So now I'm going to talk about the Silver Studio and its role in this story. Arthur Silver established his company, the Silver Studio, in 1880. So it was named for his name, not uh, the material silver. As I say, the Silver Studio was located in Hammersmith, a suburb of West London, and Arthur Silver employed a small number of designers, we're not sure how many, but probably five or six, and they created designs for wallpapers and textiles which they sold to manufacturers around the country. So I should explain that having started in 1880, the Silver Studio continued as a business until 1963. After that, the contents of the studio were given to Hornsey College of Art, which subsequently became part of Middlesex Polytechnic and then Middlesex University, hence why we have the collection now. So in the 1880s, Arthur Silver and the other designers he employed produced mainly sort of naturalistic designs for furnishing fabrics and wallpaper. They sold their designs to numerous clients, including companies such as Liberty, GP and J Baker and Stead McAlpine. By that point, Liberty was commissioning Japanese inspired designs for wallpapers and textiles from a number of British designers. So the Silver Studio was one of, one of these companies which played a key role in the interpretation of Japanese ideas for the mass market. Designers working for the Silver Studio incorporated Japanese motifs and methods into wallpaper and textile patterns for British consumers. And I realise that this design for wallpaper doesn't look very Japanese, but the inclusion of the chrysanthemum flower, not seen in Britain before it was imported from Japan, gave it a kind of exotic appeal to British consumers. But the two key materials I'm going to talk about are Katagami stencils 
and grass papers or kudzufu. And both, both of these products found their way to the West, not only as a result of the West's praise for Japan, but also as a result of massive changes that were coming about in Japan following the Meiji Restoration. So firstly, to look at katagami. These are uh, stencils made from uh, washi paper. The examples that we have in Moda are slightly larger than A4 in size. So if you can imagine, this is an A4 piece of paper-like material. Um, so this mulberry paper, which was treated in order to make it both flexible and water resistant. And the designs were cut by hand using a variety of specialised tools. And if you can imagine that this stencil is laid on fabric, uh, rice, pa rice paste pushed through the stencil, that process repeated along the length of the fabric, and then the rice paste, uh, the whole piece of fabric immersed in indigo dye. When the rice paste was washed off, the pattern would uh, remain on the fabric. So if you can imagine that's the top end of the fish and the bottom of the end of the fish join up to, to form a repeating pattern along the length of the fabric. So I'm just showing you this uh, kimono to give you a kind of idea of how this would work in practice. So this, uh, obviously not the same pattern, but katagami stencils were used to achieve this kind of small repeating pattern along, uh, across kind of kimonos intended for everyday wear. And they were traditionally used in Japan in the, in the uh, Edo period to apply, as I say, pattern to kimono fabric. So after the opening of Japan to Western trade in the 1860s and 70s, katagami stencils became much less valued in Japan as elite members of society began to favour Western dress rather than traditional kimonos. And at the same time, they became extremely popular in the West. Europeans were fascinated by the stylization of the motifs, as well as the technical brilliance of the cutting. Many thousands of katagami were acquired by Western travellers at the end of the 19th century, and are now held in museums across Europe and North America. The category <coughs> stencils that Arthur Silver acquired sometime in the 1890s became an important influence on the work of the Silver Studio in several ways. Firstly, the designers who worked for the studio created direct prints from some of the category, probably as a way of becoming more familiar with the motifs. They didn't understand that this was actually a resist method, so they created direct prints, printing through the stencils instead. Secondly, they incorporated some of the katagami motifs into their designs for textiles, albeit in what we might see as a rather clumsy fashion. So this is a design uh, on the right for a kind of, perhaps a curtain, with a scalloped border, but then in the insert bits, the, this design from this katagami had been incorporated into the design. So it's a kind of hybrid of a Western, or a design aimed at a Western market, but incorporating some elements of Japanese katagami in it. So for their British customers, the inclusion of motifs from katagami in these patterns added a touch of exotic to otherwise conventional designs. But equally important, I think, these katagami stencils prompted Arthur Silver to think about the technique of stenciling in general, since it offered an appealing combination of craft and mechanisation. And this is where I'll come on to talk about a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, about the rotten and silver stencils in a minute. But just to make the point, before I go on, that so far historians have considered the influence of these katagami 
on Western designers, tracing the way in which motifs and stylization influence both Art Nouveau and Art Deco. And this research tended to position Japan as a rather passive partner in that dialogue, with Westerners responsible for kind of appropriating motifs and adapting them for their own purposes. But new research by a PhD student, Mamiko Markham at Middlesex University, is drawing attention to the active agency of the Meiji government in this process. In other words, Westerners may have been keen to buy Katagami, but Japanese people also had to be prepared to sell them. The export of Katagami stencils to the West required the active participation of Japanese people and in this process helped to define Japanese identity both for the West and for Japan itself. So now turning to the other key material represented in Moda's collections, or key Japanese material rather, represented in Moda's collections, namely grass paper or kudzufu. So in around 1893, Arthur Silver set up a new joint venture with a business partner called Alexander Rotman. And the idea was to produce stencil wall coverings for the British market. So other British designers were also becoming interested in the idea of stenciling around this time. But Silver and Rotman created stencil wall coverings using this Japanese grass paper. So their venture, their venture was based on Japanese ideas and materials developed for Western tastes and also influenced by his knowledge of Katagami. So again, the selling point of these wall coverings was their association with ideas of Japan rather than claiming to be authentically Japanese. And here you can see one of the grass paper wall coverings with a close-up of the material on which it is printed. As you can see, the design itself is not very Japanese in appearance. But recent research on the grass paper collection at Moda is shedding new light on the relationship between, between Britain and Japan through these objects. So Professor Inaba from Japan has shown that this material, which we didn't, we were just calling this grass paper, we didn't know exactly what it was. So Professor Inaba has shown that this material is something called kudzufu, a kind of Japanese woven material made from plant fibre, which is specific to Kakagawa, a city in Shizuoka prefecture in Japan. And Professor Tsugawa Yoi, I'm sorry if I've pronounced that incorrectly, who is another leading expert in this kudzu fabric, confirms that this grass paper in the Silver Studio collection must have come from Kakagawa. So kudzu is a plant-based fibre made from a fast-growing vine, not dissimilar to Japanese knotweed, which once processed into a fibre can be woven into this elegant and hard-wearing fabric, as you see here. And Kakagawa was the centre of kudzu cloth production in the Edo period. It was one of the 53 stations on the Tokaido Road, which connected Tokyo and Kyoto. And the process of kudzu weaving was depicted by Hokusai, as you see here, in one of his famous series of prints. So during the Edo period, kudzu cloth was favoured by the samurai class. But after the Meiji Restoration, demand for the fabric for clothing purposes reduced drastically again, as people began to favour Western-style dress. And as a consequence, Japanese producers started to make this cloth in wider widths and to export it to the West for use as wall coverings. So they changed their looms, making them slightly wider, three foot wide. So this export process was not government-led, but was operated independently by private producers in Kakagawa.
So again, we can see this as an example, not of Japan standing passively by while the West appropriated its cultural products, but of Japan taking an active part in re reinventing those products for export as part of the huge social and economic change that was happening as a result of the uh, Meiji Restoration. So as I say, we're now certain that the Silk Studio Collection's grass papers were originally made in Kakegawa, although the designs were probably applied here in London. It's fascinating that this material found its way to Britain and was used by the Silk Studio for wall coverings intended for British homes. Professor Inaba is planning an exhibition of this material, kudzu or grass paper, in Kakagawa in 2025. And we're hoping to lend her a number of items from our collection. So to conclude, when I first started researching the Japanese objects, which are part of the Silver Studio collection, I followed the accepted view that Westerners simply appropriated Japanese motifs and materials, and that Japanese people themselves played very little role in that process. So I'm really delighted that new research carried out by Mamiko Markham and Professor Inaba in Japan is demonstrating that the picture is much more complex, much less straightforward. It's becoming clear that the government, the Japanese government and private industry played an active part in the export of particular kinds of design goods, and in particular, Katsugami stencils and kudzu textiles. This process helped to shape Western perceptions of Japanese national identity, and perhaps also influenced Japan's perception of itself during the last decades of the 19th century. Thank you.